Oti Telegon, a Jani, or Mamma Modu. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, let's rise for the national anthem. start the program, let me start with uh, introductions. I'll just try to go uh, around the hall and try to see who and who I can recognize. Um, you know, the chairman of this occasion is His Excellency, Mr. Chief John Dramani Mahama. He's actually a chief. He got a uh, chieftaincy title this March 2024. In addition, to many other recognitions uh, that he has had. Uh, but I will have an opportunity to introduce him uh, fully later. And of course, Porti, who has made it possible uh, for him. And that's the Chief Mrs. Mugolaji Momoto. Chief Mrs. Yulia Kerugu, Yulia thank you for supporting our brother and for making it easy for him to continue to achieve. And I see the children now here. Yeah? Uh, the respect for Mamadou. Uh, any other is here? Any Toyola is here? Okay, it's Kurewa Adam. Okay, Kurewa is a young one. He is in school abroad. I understand Adia Bola is around. I will soon have. Oh, how are you, ma? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. I said it to come back at the PM. Yes, and that's the rule. Okay, very quickly, we are here to celebrate Chief Billy Mamadou. He was born uh, 16 May 1960, as I pointed out, and today is the day. Uh, but he has chosen not the, 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 the law firm to pursue. He has chosen the option of intellectual discourse on a very important subject, which is the politics of energy and the way forward. You all know him, he's a publisher. He's a businessman, founder, and chief executive, and chairman of Vision International. He's a public affairs analyst, he's a philanthropist, he's a community leader, he's a journalist. Now, uh, he was born in uh, Ife, May 16, uh, 1960. One of the things that happened was that uh, by the time he was 13, his father died. But one of the major pillars of his life, his mom, resolved that he would be successful and his father's death would not affect him. Then, of course, uh, we went to where some of these secondary schools, you know, I don't like to mention some secondary schools because they are this way to secondary schools. Uh, I think he first went to initial grammar school. Uh, well, initial, I don't know, there's one other school, I think, the Rubu Rubu. <laughs> Some of these people were doing that and let me hear the name of their secondary school. <laughs> but in any case, you know, Chief Billy Momodu then went to the prestigious University of Ife, which later became a Bakami Awolowo University, where he got a master's degree in English literature. And then after that master's degree in uh, English literature, you know, the many things that he has done. He has been a journalist, beginning in 1988, as a reporter with the African Concord. From the African Concord, he was uh, uh, deployed to the Weekend Concord, where he rose to become a line editor. 
At the same time, it will politically, you know, in all the uh, confounded titles, and uh, became very famous, you know, for his uh, lightness. Um, he later left uh, Weekend Paper and went to Plastic Magazine, where he worked with uh, May Ellen uh, Ezekiel. I think before then, you know, he had done quite a number of things. He used to be a, a hotel manager, a um, hotel, hotel, uh, one hotel in uh, Ito, uh, you know, owned by uh, Chief, uh, 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 by uh, Obashidu Adi at that time. Hotel Royal, Hotel Royal, that's the name of the hotel. At another point, he was private secretary in the Second Republic to Chief Akin. Omoguri Uwo, a second republic uh, politician. And then he also went to teach briefly at the Oyo State uh, School of Arts and uh, Sciences. So, you know, there are many people who remember him as their teacher. And then in between when he was in Lagos, I think his old great was Hawking Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Chief. Uh, Bashar Renku Adela had this uh, victory called Wonder Loose. So, but they at that time used to carry load, uh, uh, bread in the loose of bread in the boot of his car, you know, uh, in practical, you know, uh, on a kind of water fashion, you know, <laughs> one route. Many routes lead to the market. In between, he was also a PR consultant, celebrities uh, goodwill, you know, which he uh, was managing. But then, of course, what most people know today is his involvement in politics, and he got into politics through activism. When in 1992-93 we had the general elections won by Chief M. P. Abiola, and that election was annulled. He was one of those people, you know, uh, who went to the barricades. For his uh, temerity, he was detained at Palagon Cruz. In 1995, the Abacha government was looking for him. They wanted to uh, charge him for a treasonable felony. So he decided to take the Nadeko route. <laughs> the Nadeko route, he went through Benin, to Togo, to Ghana, only to show up in the United uh, Kingdom. And it was when he was in the United Kingdom that he established uh, Ovation uh, International, which became a major celebrity uh, publication, a major contribution to journalism, which even had a bilingual edition at that time and became a magazine of choice uh, for many people. Apart from the magazine, we also had Ovation Carols. Ovation Carols also became Ovation Carols and Awards. And of course, the Honorable B continues to write uh, prolifically uh, in the uh, Nigerian uh, media. While he was in exile, Again, one of the gains of exile was that he was involved with uh, Radio Freedom. Radio Freedom was a you know anti-military channel that was established in the UK then by a number of uh, Nigerians who wanted democracy, and uh, it was uh, Radio Freedom later became Radio uh, Gujarat, and I think it was uh, Sabitiu Elenugbogoro, Sali Elenugbogoro, you know, on that uh, radio. Uh, 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 freedom uh, radio could uh, do And here we are today. You know, he's not just a journalist or a philanthropist, he's also uh, a traditional community leader. He's most recently, and I was trying to remember that title, he was honored with the title of Akinrogu of uh, Mogoland. He was also uh, honored with the title Aretayeshi of Iwoland. He's also Bashonu. Of Okela Koromo, and he has a honorary, honorary uh, doctorate in many letters uh, from uh, the University, uh, Pan African uh, University of Leadership in Accra, Ghana, in addition uh, to many other honors. Well, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Chief David Mohammed, Chairman, Publisher, Investment International. May I invite him now? To give his welcome remarks. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, 
Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the inaugural Daily Mumudu Leadership Lecture on the occasion of my 64th birthday. You may be wondering, why is he starting a lecture series? The reason is not far from it. The clock is ticking, and by the grace of God, on my next birthday, I will be 65. And will undoubtedly qualify to be an elder statesman. In my moment of soliloquy, I asked, what next? I'm sure I have written over a thousand articles, spoken endlessly on radio and television, but not much has changed for my greatly endowed country, Nigeria, and its long-suffering people. My verdict was that criticism alone cannot do the job. I decided to use my God-given wealth of influence and confidence to reach out to our leaders, technocrats, and my fellow citizens in general. So the next phase of my struggle will be to encourage some dialogue and conversations. And someone who follows his thoughts with action so I immediately came up with the idea of a national and international lecture. And this is the first of its series. So my first move was to think of a topic. That was quite easy. My country is riddled with all manner of debilitating challenges of which we are all guilty in various degrees of culpability. Rather than continue to have the blame game, of which again we are all experts at, and we are also champions of complaining and lamenting like the biblical Jeremiah, so I decided to do something. Why can't we end this endless energy crisis? The most disturbing thing for a Nigerian and the most embarrassing is this energy thing. If I say it's rocket science and we go to smaller countries and we enjoy this energy that we cannot have here. So I thought to myself, if I want to buy any product, all I need to do is pay and it will be delivered to me. So how come we pay for electricity and it cannot be delivered? I can see Prof looking at me. That is the challenge I'm throwing at you and our leaders seated here today. With all our numbers investments in electricity, they've all gone up practically in smoke. The more we paid, the less electricity we got. Since electricity affects all of us, we should gather in this room today and discuss solutions in a non-partisan atmosphere. Ah, you are welcome, Your Excellency, Senator Radu Musa Kwankwaso, the former governor of Kano State and former presidential candidate. Thank you so much for coming. So, as I told former Vice President Atiku Abubakar a few days ago, let it be said that I played my part very well. And that should be the mission of everyone in this room, play your part very well. So after picking the topic, I had to find the lecturer who must be well grounded in the subject matter. I thought of no other than my dear brother, 
Professor Bartholomew Unaji, who is seated here today. His intimidating resume speaks for itself. So I won't bore you with it because we'll be here all day if we were to look at it, but we'll be publishing it later. So on 20th March 2014, I took a leap of faith and sent a message to him requesting for just two minutes, a, a two minute call. Pronto, he responded. And we spoke for exactly two minutes. His words were truly encouraging and inspiring. Dele, you are not just a consequential Nigerian, but a consequential African. I will not say no to your request and declare today. Thank you. Thank you. In the choice of today's chairman, I wasted no time in calling on the great African leader, the former president of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama, who in 18 months of one tenure, not second tenure, one tenure, he has one more to go. Hopefully, he will get it this year. I said, please, I want you to be the chairman. He told me, daily consider it done. He will be here any minute from now. He landed in Nigeria last night, having flown from London to Ghana two days ago, and had to travel out of Accra to come back to Accra and land in Lagos last night. So the way they are in the traffic are uh, trying to navigate their way to NIA. So, of course, my brother, I call him Peter the Rock. Former governor, Peter Obi. Anytime you call him, he's always as cool as Count of the Kukumba. So, I, my brother, why not? This man, we met on a flight to London last year, and it was around the time of my birthday. So I told him, I said, my birthday is on Tuesday. He said, oh, it's going somewhere. Then he went to Italy or something. He said, but the day of your birthday is, I'm leaving on Virgin Atlantic in the night to Lagos. He said, so I will check in and come to your house. I was looking at the logistics and then, no, it's not possible. He won't believe it. He showed up like an apparition in my house. <laughs> so please help me give him a big round of applause. So I called, I have a young friend. He is my button to Senator Ali Haji, that's Mubarak Maso, and that's Mubarak. Where is Mubarak? That's my best friend. So anytime I want to reach his dad, I just call Mubarak. He said, give me some time, I'll come back to you. And I called Mubarak. And then, maybe around midnight, you know, I like to walk late into the night. I don't know how he does it, but he is such a brilliant gentleman. So Mubarak called me, said, hold on for daddy. So I told daddy, I said, please, I want you to come to Lagos. I know how far Lagos is from Abuja. And these days, uh, for people who don't have too much flying, <laughs> it can be very uh, difficult. And he said, Look, I will honor you. You won't believe it. Till Mubarak called me again a few nights ago. I was still doubting that maybe they would call me. If I, when I saw his call, I thought he was going to say, oh, sorry, daddy cannot make it. Daddy is there. Please. <laughs> He is one of the most powerful, one of the most dogged politicians in Nigeria. And I, I'm sure he's following in the robust tradition of Kano politics. Uh, the Malam Aminu Kano, the Abuba Karibis, and I'm happy that we still have people like you in our political system. May Allah continue to bless you, sir. So, the next thing. I wanted a venue. Uh, you would have expected that maybe we go to a cool and all that. But how do you listen to a good lecture in a too comfortable environment? 
<laughs> so I said, no. I wanted a serious environment where everybody, oh, please, help me welcome the former president of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama, please. Thank you, sir. I knew the, the rain did you some shaky, but uh, we are representing you. Fortunately, my speech is the first, so you haven't been anything, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes. So I settled for a place as the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, which I like to call our own Charter Mouse. Our own Charter Mouse is abandoned. And it to send a powerful message to all of us that we should not abandon this place. The Director General is here, President Friday. Please stand up for the reason. Fantastic man. He invited me to be an associate fellow here, and I'm very grateful. I promise you that we will do something here, and I'm happy that we're doing it now. This is the bastion of intellectual diplomacy and home to robust ideas. I knew if auditorium was not in top shape, but this would be an opportunity to address the ugly attitude of ignoring our age-old institutions by making my own contribution. So as a man of modest income, you must have read my letter. I'm proud to say I'm a man of modest income. I offered to buy two new air conditioners. You can see one there, you can see one there. Otherwise, we'll be sweating by now. I decided to change the red carpet so you can see it looks new. That is what my modest income can afford. <laughs> So, just like I did in my own village, you see, I realized that we all want to live comfortably within our homes without taking care of our environment. So in my village, in the event, in our one is local government of Edo State, I had to tie the road to my village, to my home in the village, the home village. Because otherwise, all of us will buy navigators and be navigating through undulating roads. So, that is what we did. Then beyond this cosmetic arrangement, there was something more important to me. In 1994, on this very podium, this was where Chief Monsieur Kashimawo Olawale Abiola, my adopted father, attended his last corporate event, which was hosted by Oduka Otagena. So for me, it brings back those memories. And I'm happy to announce that I have in this audience his daughter, who happens to be one of my biggest fans. I don't know what I've done to deserve it, but I have two good. Abiola, please stand up. Please Abiola, you know what say? television celebrity, extremely brilliant like, like brilliant like his dad. And then I have a young friend who had to skip school today just to be with me. I didn't know until his mom told me, and that's Abiola's grandchild, correct? Please stand up for recognition. You know, you know how you affect people when you do things. So he insisted he must come with the mom and they are here today. That's how I operate. If I believe in you, it doesn't matter. I will follow you to the depth of the ocean. Uh, President Mahama knows that. <laughs> there is nothing they've not done to separate us. I said, mm -hmm. we can't do that. Um, so, he's not here, but he's on his way. I can never thank enough our chief host, who is my boy by three days. But in our culture, three days makes you a permanent older person. And that is His Excellency, Governor Ademola Rudin Jackson, Adeleke, the Governor of Bolivia State, will be joining us in the minute. 
Then I needed a brain box. A brain box. I consult him. People think you can do things alone. No matter how brilliant you are, you must seek help. The brain box is sitting right here. It's a little older. This is the biggest in Brandon in Nigeria, if not Africa. And this man, I'm sure he doesn't mind, was battling with cancer and battling with other ailments. And he insisted we must have a session. If I think all the branding you are seeing, it did gratis. Please help me thank you. He is such a man of courage. I call him Professor Socrates. So whenever I need something creative, I run to Professor Socrates. So I'm not advertising, but I am promoting that whenever you need to do something serious, please talk to this genius. Uh, I can go on and on and on, but I don't want to take so much of your time because the lecturer is ready and uh, Yes. We had arrived in uh, Senator Rabi Omusa Pampanso, a uh, presidential candidate of the NMPP in the 2023 general elections and former uh, governor of Kano State. The Excellency, welcome, sir. And then also the chairman of this occasion arrived. Uh, but before I introduce the chairman, trying to give him a little time to catch his breath uh, because he just joined us. But 2023 uh, general elections. Mr. Ralph Lehman, thank you for joining us. Dr. Bobby Moreau, Council South African Embassy, thank you. Ketura King, I see you. Thank you for coming. Right, okay. And then very quickly. I'm now going to invite the uh, chairman of this occasion uh, to give his opening remarks before we go uh, to the main lecture. Much later, the introductions will continue. But we're very privileged to have uh, President John uh, Germani Mahama, one of those African leaders who have practically done everything. He started his political career as uh, a member of parliament, representing the uh, uh, it's a Bali Bombay uh, constituency from the upper Abuja region. And then he later went on to become a deputy minister and later a substantive minister of communications. So look at it MP, member of parliament, uh, uh, deputy minister, minister, later became vice president. And then uh, when we had that unfortunate incident of the death of uh, President John Atan Rose, he assumed the uh, office, and that was in 2012, July 2012. And he was president of Ghana from 2012 to 2017. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> now, at the moment, President Mahama is the presidential candidate of the National Democratic Congress in the forthcoming 2024 general elections. During the primaries, we won the uh, selection process, the voting process, by over 99% of the votes. This shows uh, his uh, popularity. Now, President Mahama is also an author, uh, author of My First School Data, which is a book I recommend you know, uh, to you all, very well written. And nobody should be surprised because he's also a writer. You know, he used to uh, uh, he used to run a column in one of the newspapers in Ghana uh, titled Mahama's Armor. <laughs> okay, well, no, 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 in when no intended. <laughs> but in addition to this, he has also served Africa, particularly uh, in various capacities. He's been chairman of the uh, ECOWAS, uh, ECOWAS uh, the regional body. Uh, he has led missions to elections, and he was the first Ghanaian president who became president, who was born after Ghanaian independence. Uh, and then, of course, continues to be honored all over the world, and he has very strong connections with Nigeria. 
He was uh, given an honorary uh, doctorate degree, for example, by Kitty State University. The, the Faculty of Management Sciences of that Kitty State University is also named after him. So in addition to many international you know, uh, honors, awards, and recognitions. And President Mahama, here as chairman, at a discourse on the politics of energy and the way forward. I mean, we could not have chosen a better chair. Because the subject is a subject that is very familiar, that resonates with the good people of Ghana. There's something in Ghana they call Dumso. Dumso means power cuts. And it was uh, a very serious problem between 2012 and 2017. Now, up to now, this is 2024. Ghanaians are still talking about the effect of doing so on businesses and lifestyles and productivity. So you see, we have a lot in common with, uh, with Ghana. President Mahama, I think one thing. Thank you very much. And uh, let me celebrate my friend and brother, uh, David Momodu, and uh, to congratulate him on this initiative and thank him for inviting me to join you. There are so many distinguished uh, citizens here. And um, in order that I don't fall into the danger of not acknowledging anybody, let me proceed on the uh, protocols that have been established. Apologies for my late arrival. Um, we uh, had a problem with the rainstorm that suddenly broke when we were about to set up, and uh, I'm happy that finally we are right. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here today to chair the inaugural Daily Momodu Leadership Lecture, the theme of which is the politics of energy and the way forward for Nigeria. This theme is most appropriate and suitable because despite Africa's tremendous energy resources such as hydro, wind, solar, and hydrocarbon potential, the continent continues to suffer from a severe energy deficit that undermines equitable economic growth and development. As you may be aware, the African continent is home to about 17.89% of the world's population. And it has about 600, of, 600 million of its people without access to electricity. With a staggering 98% in sub-Saharan Africa, and another 940 million people lacking access to clean cooking fuels and technologies. This calls for bold and decisive policies by continental leaders and pulling resources together if the continent is to achieve the sustainable development goal number seven, which is sustainable and modern energy by the year 2030. World energy politics and the role of Nigeria. By its size, economic power, and population alone, Nigeria can be described as a natural continental economic leader and powerhouse in Africa. When we look more specifically at the country's energy resources, such as its oil, gas, and other minerals, Nigeria has a unique opportunity and the potential to achieve energy security and sufficiency for itself and indeed the entire West African sub-region. Today our world is at the crossroads of what has become known as the energy trilemma. That is sustainability, energy security, and affordability. Already many Western countries have taken the path of transitioning to renewable energy, primarily because of the factor of climate change and partly due to global geopolitical tensions. As a result, most sub-Saharan African countries are at the high risk of ha having stranded assets in petroleum reserves and infrastructure. Nigeria and sub-Saharan Africa must address the critical question about which energy pathway we intend to adopt. Are we to take a path of a wholesome, a wholesale transition 
by capping our oil and gas wells, or must we adopt a customized energy transition that prioritizes climate justice, wealth creation, and inclusive growth? And Sub-Saharan Africa, especially West African sub-region, is looking up to our big brother, Nigeria, to make this decision. And this is the moment Nigeria must show leadership in the global politics of energy. Ghana's power sector has evolved over the years with the first power plants, the Akosomo Hydroelectric Dam, which currently, currently produces 1,020 megawatts capacity, constructed under our nation's first president, Osajoko Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, in 1967. In 1982, the Kong Hydroelectric Power Station was commissioned, and this increased Ghana's installed hydro generation capacity by another 160 megawatts. Although the Akosombo and Horn dams were designed to provide adequate electricity generation into the foreseeable future, Ghana suffered its first power crisis in 1984, following a severe drought, disrupting the generational capacity of the two hydro dams. And despite the with increasing energy demand coupled with unpredictable hydrology, dependence on the country's hydro potential as a sole source of electricity has proved untenable. And therefore, a decision was taken to diversify the nation's generation mix by introducing thermal power and other forms of energy to augment the hydro capacity from the 1990s. So a crippling energy crisis and as um, our um, compare said, it's properly called doom so in Ghana. Doom means off, so means on. So it means off and on. That's a literal translation of uh, doom so. I don't know how you see it in Nigeria, but I, I remember when I was here, it says never don't take power. As a result of this crisis, and I was president then, I led the fastest mobilization of thermal power in the history of Ghana, mobilizing about a thousand megawatts of emergency thermal power to the county's generation mix by the time I left office in 2017. Mindful of the need to attain fuel supply security and reliability while addressing environmental concerns, the government of Ghana initiated various policy measures to ensure that the country derives maximum ben benefits from its newly discovered oil and gas resources by ushering in what we call the gas to power era. This was uh, uh, evidence in the establishment of the Ghana National Gas Development Task Force to review and propose approaches to ensure full utilization of the country's gas resources through a gas commercialization project in 2009. And this culminated in the completion of the $1 billion a travel gas processing plant in 2015 and is located at a travel in the Lembele district of the Western region to process, transport, and market Ghana's domestic natural gas from Ghana's Jubilee and 10 fields to meet domestic and industrial needs of the country. Following the discovery of additional gas resources in the offshore Cape Three Points area in 2009, we decided to leverage the World Bank and other partners to undertake the US $7.7 .7 billion Sankofa Natural Gas Project by constructing an integrated offshore oil and gas processing plant to supply additional gas capable of generating 1,100 megawatts of thermal power. You're welcome, Your Excellency. These policy interventions have resulted in domestic gas accounting for about 82% of Ghana's thermal requirements and 40% of domestic LPG, 80% of all electricity is generated using uh, liquid natural gas. The other 20% continues to rely on fossil fuels. So the plan going forward is to be able to cover the total generation with liquid natural gas 100% by 
before the year 2030. The decision to switch to gas as an alternative to light crude oil has undoubtedly resulted in increased fuel supply and reliability and significant cost savings for the country. For instance, in 2022, 107.65 billion scale of gas was exported from Ghana's oil producing fields for power generation and industrial consumption. This is equivalent to 200, this is equivalent to 20 million gas is estimated at 1.34 billion. It means that if Ghana was continuing to use light crude oil instead of natural gas, we would have had to spend $1.54 billion uh, over the period. As enough dependable generation capacity at 5,454 uh, 5, megawatts. And so the current zoom saw that we're going through is not because we don't have the generation capacity, it's because we don't have enough fuel to be able to meet the demand. And so current generation capacity stands at 5,454 megawatts for the, both for domestic consumption and Ghana currently exports power to neighboring Togo, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Benin within the framework of ECOWAS cooperation. I'll touch a bit on the West African power pool in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, on the local front, an aggressive rural electrification policy launched in 2009 increased electricity access rates in Ghana from 60.8% to over 80% in eight years. The solid foundation we laid has resulted in an impressive 88.5% um, current access rate. It means that 88.5% of Ghanaians have access to electric power. And Ghana is on course to achieve universal access to electricity um, at the target date. Policy reforms have equally been at the center stage of our energy sector with power sector reform dating back to the early 1990s by the Ghanaian government resulting in the creation of an energy commission in 1997 as a technical regulator of electricity, natural gas and renewable energy industries. And also the formation of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission in the same year provides guidelines for tariffs and charges on public utility services, especially water and electricity. More importantly, we have abandoned the vertically integrated Volta River Authority. And I'm sure you would have heard about it. They are the managers of the Kosovo and the electric power station. But they also control the national electric grid. And so we abandoned it and made them concentrate on power generation. And then we formed Grifo, which is responsible for all the transmission lines uh, in the country for electricity to satisfy domestic use and export and gas supply constraints is beginning to pose significant challenges threatening the nation's power supply reliability as demand continues to increase. It's estimated that demand increases between 10 and 12 percent every year and so it means that you must always plan ahead both in terms of having access to enough fuel and also putting in the generation capacity to be able to meet that demand. Since the beginning of the year, power supply reliability has been erratic, largely due to the inability of the current government to expand and increase the gas infrastructure to meet the rising demand. This therefore calls for very serious policy rethinking if we are to resolve this current challenge. And that's why the comparison that uh, Dusov is back um, this year will be suffering a lot of power outages in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, with the 2024 elections around the corner, my party has proposed to declare 2025 as an accelerated age of oil and gas production should we win the elections. Natural gas will be the central area of focus for us, for our future. Private partners such as the Chamber of African Producers of Ghana have already declared their commitment to invest in natural gas exploration and production with the needed government support. Let me use this opportunity to invite potential uh, investors in Nigeria when it comes to oil and gas production. You are big brothers, and I know you have more expertise than us. 
And so I use this occasion to invite potential investors from Nigeria to invest in Ghana's hydrocarbon potential. Let me also commend Nigeria for its leadership in the implementation of the West African Gas Pipeline Company, WAPO, which has played a critical role in Ghana's energy future. Following on the success of the West African Gas Pipeline Company model, I firmly believe that we can replicate the model in the downstream petroleum sector for our mutual benefits. The future of South Saharan African development greatly depends on the success story of Nigeria's energy sector. I wish to call on Nigeria to lead the politics of energy resources in Africa. On this note, there is an urgent need for Ghana and Nigeria to deepen our economic and technical cooperation in harnessing and developing our energy resource potential for energy security and reliability and equitable wealth distribution for the entire West African sub-region. The establishment of the West African Power Pool, which I talked about just a while ago, the wholesale market presents an excellent opportunity for energy integration in West Africa. Ghana has already constructed a high voltage electricity transmission network that connects us to Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Cote d'Ivoire. So it makes it possible for us to evacuate excess power into the grid for export to any of these countries. The critical step left is the synchronization of the entire West African power pool in the connected transmission system, which includes a link with the Nigerian system and also a connection to Niger and the northern parts of Togo and Benin. This will undoubtedly create a great opportunity for ECOWAS countries, especially notably Nigeria, because Nigeria has the potential to have excess power that it can put into the West African power pool for use by other countries that have a deficit. So notably, Nigeria with vast resources and available generation capacity to trade in the regional electricity markets will be an advantage for our sub region. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, with our rich historical ties, the two countries of Ghana and Nigeria must urgently lead the process of realizing a fully liberalized and interconnected energy market in West Africa, to which energy sources, especially gas and electricity, can be easily traded amongst themselves. Finally, the energy sector is the foundation for economic growth. Nigeria must take the leadership mantle to build a regional consensus that will provide a more promising future for Africa. African leaders must define their energy transition modalities and choose the most equitable, just transition. Nigeria has what it takes to lead the path for Sub-Saharan Africa to advance our collective energy agenda by engaging its leaders, such as Ghana, to achieve the delivery of reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy for the whole sub-region. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The big takeaway for me is what His Excellency said in the energy transition. And perhaps be the hub to look for that transition within this West African region. Leadership. Again, that's why we are here today. Now, as the President Mahama was making his presentation, we had the arrival of the chief host of this event, His Excellency the Governor of uh, Osho State, the Performing and Action Governor of Osho State. Please listen to me very well. If you go and use another phrase, you are your own. His Excellency Senator Timola Jackson and David. And they assure you on every 
Congratulations on your two days in office. And also, we also have the Royal Majesty, Alayrua, Abdul Rashid, Abdewale, Akonbe, and Potelu, Yoru of Yoru, Tabiosu. I'm here on the TV surprise at M. Potelu, the first one here. Chibele Momodu is the Aretayishi of Yoru. And Chief Mrs. Mbalaji Momodu is the Aretayishi of Yoru. Dr. Ruben Adasi. We are just in the view of Yoru. It's a Wikipedia of uh, a lot of things about the nation and the world. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, the Chairman of the Occasion, John Kermani Mahama, I understand that uh, you also uh, you will become chief in our country. So, congratulations. Former President of Ghana. Your Excellency, Chief Ademola Adeleke, Governor of Bosnia State and Chief Post. Your Excellency, Mr. Peter Lee. Your Excellency, Senator Pampaso. Your Excellency, Donald Joe. Uh, very distinguished. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to plead your indulgence to rest on an already established protocol, as we say here in Nigeria. So, um, I, just like the President uh, and Chairman said, I don't want to fall into the trap of having to miss so many people because it is totally possible considering the number of very distinguished people here. Let me first start by congratulating Are Dele Momodu, Chairman of Probation Group, for joining us. Actually, he said that he joined us four years ago on the sixth floor. Um, though you have many years yet on this floor, you have managed to pass so many accomplishments on your journey up to the various laws to this one. So your friends, family, and I are wishing a life of happiness, prosperity, and good health to you as you climb to the rest of the floors that the Almighty may grant you. I also want to thank you so much for asking me to do this. The very first uh, you know, this lecture series. And uh, what you said is so apt because we need to begin to really get into our minds about solving our problems. And the topic chosen must be appropriate, something that really goes to the heart of the matter. And I believe, uh, Dele, you have been a man of great character, not prone to bend to the whims and caprices of our nation's powers. I recall how you gallantly chose me as your 2012th man of the year, even though I had resigned as Minister of Power in previous August. You asked the then Governor of Rivers States, Right Honorable Rotimi Amechi, to come all the way from, from Port Harcourt to make the presentation to me in early 2013. Such act stands you out as someone who looks beyond the chatter of our impious politics in whatever you do. God bless you. you. 
I like to think, and I think all of us who are here listening to President Mao, I think <laughs> that it is important for someone who occupies the sort of position that we have occupied and seeks to occupy to have good mastery of statistics and knowledge of what the subject is about. He has been able to, to tell us a lot about the value chain of energy. He's also been able to link it with politics and the economics. So thank you very much, sir. In fact, you made my job easier because the lecturers need to talk about politics of energy. So I will go straight to the politics of energy and not have to address all these wonderful issues that you've covered. Thank you. The economy runs on energy. That's very clear. Contemporary geopolitics are shaped by energy. For instance, it is wondered whether the United States of America would have risked the lives of thousands of its troops and spent so much financial resources on rescuing Kuwait from the vice grip of the then Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein. If the little desert nation with fast cop population had not been full of petroleum. The speculation is important because when Saddam Hussein moved into Kuwait on 8 August 1989 and occupied it, which caused pandemonium throughout the globe, Liberia was about to start a descent into anarchy. Liberia is not just another country. It was an American colony created for free, free slaves, free African slaves, its capital, Monrovia, is named after the fifth American president, James Monroe, who was president of America from 1817 to 1825, widely remembered for the Monroe Doctrine that the American hemisphere should be treated as the American backyard. The doctrine precludes outsiders from meddling in affairs around the United States. Yes, Washington ignored the chaos and anarchy in Liberia that started on December 24, 1989, when Charles Taylor led the National Patriotic Front of Liberia to launch a war from Nimba County that shares border with the Ivory Coast. Nigeria was compelled the giant of Africa to not only move its troops, army, navy, and air force into Liberia, but also spend a fortune in the country on that lost pieces of economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. I understand that at the end of the war, Nigeria lost about a thousand officers and soldiers. That is the whole battalion and also spent some $8 billion on the ECOMOC operation. Now, let us move away from events of the 1990s and the wars. Let us reflect on the international events of the last couple of years concerning energy. The West, particularly Western Europe, has been mounting a relentless campaign for cleaner energy. It wants the world to embrace solar, wind, and other forms of renewable energy, like hydropower. It has been asking mostly developing countries to abandon coal in particular, referring to it as the greatest environmental pollutant through carbon emission. It has been, it has even added natural gas to the list. So when the President was talking about natural gas, 
and the plan to uh, of his government to the wind to focus also on natural gas just to, to know that these people have added natural gas as a major pollutants. So it has added natural gas all in an effort to make the world limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2030 as required by the Paris Accord for on climate change of 2015. Something dramatic was to happen in 2022. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, European nations imposed a series of sanctions on Russia. Moscow, in return, took punitive actions against the West. Western countries like Germany, which depended largely on gas exports from Russia, began to feel the pinch that it had resolved under Angela Merkel to close that. Though there was no imminent threat to power shortage in Germany, Berlin chose to reverse its policy on coal plants rather than risk in any way the chance of its people suffering any form of electricity crisis. Germany was not alone. The United Kingdom, which had prided itself on shutting down its coal-fired plants and on building large wind farms, decided to resuscitate its coal plants. Why? It didn't want its citizens to suffer the 2022 heat wave and do it. A similar scenario emerged in France the same year, faced with winter, which could hurt its people. Paris chose to extend the lifespans of its coal-fired plants. Though electricity from coal was responsible for only about 0.6% of national electricity in, in France, the French government had to extend the lifespans of coal-fired plants just to protect its people. The United States is proud that several of its coal-fired plants have been decommissioned Coal used to account for 50% of American nitrous electricity, but the figure has now reduced to about 17.8%, and it is expected that it may decline to 4% by 2030. Environmentalists are delighted at the rapid decline, but it would appear that the decline has not been driven by as much commitment to environmental protection as by economics. Even though the Joe Biden administration has a special envoy on climate change, it is easier and cheaper to run a natural gas fired plant than a coal fired one. As a fact, in fact, a coal fired plant, let's use Nigeria, uh, uh, would cost you anywhere from 1.3, so a gas fire will cost you anywhere from 1.3 to 1.5 million dollars to install one meg. There is the argument that repurposing the plants from coal fires to nuclear will reduce the cost of building brand new stations by 30%. A nuclear plant requires a fraction of the fuel required by say a coal fired plant to produce certain amounts of power. And the primary raw material used for nuclear energy is uranium, which is mined and therefore constitutes environmental degradation. Of course, it is not only nations that have displayed self-interest in dialogue over fossil fuels. Take the case of the five superstar oil and gas companies. Shell, ExxonMobil, Total Energies, 
Chevron and British Petroleum in the vanguard of the campaign for clean energy and paid a price for it. While it was quoting big profits, its stock performance on the exchanges was flat. This changed with the assumption of office of Wild Sewan, the Lebanese Canadian, as its chief executive officer in January of 2023. Sewan has left no one in doubt that his loyalty is not to environmentalists, but to shareholders. Shell has resumed heavy investments in oil and gas. It has reduced its climate ambitions by scaling down its goal of reducing the net carbon intensity of its energy products from 30% to 50% by 2030. Its investment in renewables came down from $3.5 billion in 2022 to $2.5 billion in the same year, in, in 2023. Shell is not alone. The other British superstar petroleum company, BP, has taken similar steps. Its investment in low carbon energy are seven times less than its investment in fossil fuel, while those of Shell are five times lower. Total, total energy of France in April 2023 announced a reduction of its climate ambitions from 35 to 40% in, in, in emissions in 2030 to 20 to 30% in the range in the same period. The Shell CEO has an interesting explanation for the new ongoing huge investment in oil and gas, energy security. I believe what you are really saying, and so you're on your own, and you have to achieve what they want, but they're going to do what they want to ensure that they have energy security. Now, renewable energy has been marketed as a silver bullet to climate change, used with electric vehicles, solar panels, solar batteries, wind farms, dams, etc. From China, like those from BYD, they work and so therefore working very hard to produce more affordable vehicles. This is um, this thing has happened in America in the past in terms of uh, when they began to talk about emissions. So the Japanese were producing cheaper vehicles and also better emitting uh, uh, carbon emitting vehicles. And Americans had to go and compete and begin to produce them to catch up. So, um, what is more, there are not enough supercharger networks in the United States. So what still matters whether electric cars could not recharge at Tesla's facilities until recently, they're beginning to uh, change. Solar panels and batteries do not charge at night, we know that. This adds to the deficit of high cost, especially in poor nations. However, those deficiencies are hardly mentioned in mainstream Western media. It is like a wind farm works only when there is considerable wind. Uh, but this inadequacy is also not usually discussed. So you can imagine if uh, we begin to uh, rely on, on wind farms, there are only certain parts of Nigeria where this could work. Um, solar is something uh, solar the solar intensity is also uh, an issue. So certainly in parts of the southern part, you don't have enough to power solar. It's not that you can't at all. It is just that you don't have enough 
to make it economically viable. You can do it, you know, the rooftops and so on. But the big solar farms are more economical where the, um, uh, the intensity is higher. So, a critical raw material used in the production of solar panels and batteries is lithium iron. It is a mineral like coal or crude oil. It is mined. The process of extracting it is environmentally hazardous as well. But this is not usually discussed. In Chile, where it is produced more than in any other country, nearby rivers have been polluted. Protests by citizens against pollution have been met by brute force, by security agents, violating the rights and dignity of the people. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, where cobalt, copper, and lithium iron are produced massively, there are human rights abuses on an industrial scale. There is also child labor in addition to other forms of labor exploitation. The beneficiaries are mostly Western multinationals. The DRC government, towards the end of April 2024, hired the services of a team of French lawyers, the rights to Apple Corporation, the American technology giants, accusing it of benefiting from illegal actions in recent parts of its country, where lithium iron and copper are used in manufacture are used in manufacture of electronic gadgets like our smartphones and uh, solar panels as well as the uh, batteries where they are mined. Rebels are active very much so in those parts of the earth, you can imagine, because the the big companies that rely on this hire rebels also to be uh, part of the business. In New York State, where the government plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 and by 85% by 2050 from 1990 level through solar and wind power, there have been protests against the conversion of farmlands to solar and wind farms. There have also been protests against the destruction of biodiversity and the habitat generally. And this is in America. The most difficult and controversial issue deliberated on at the Conference of Parties, popularly known as COP28, which held in Dubai from December 13 last year, was the fate of fossil fuels. At the end of the deliberations, participants agreed on a shift that would happen in just, in a quote, just, orderly, and equitable manner. No date or timeline was given. But it was provided that developing economies, particularly those that depend on fossil fuels, be assisted. In doing so, the level of development and poverty of each in each country will be taken into consideration. We are yet to see how this is going to happen. We're very interested in it. Much as the agreements and wording of the resolutions are considered a win-win for those who wanted an immediate ban on fossil fuels and those opposed to the idea completely. It is often wondered whether the participants could have taken a, a more realistic, different position. The world needs environmental protection, but the world just cannot do without fossil fuel. As experience has demonstrated in just the last two years, European nations that have been in the forefront for clean energy found themselves returning to coal-fired plants 
when their interests were threatened in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine two years ago. The United States relies on fossil fuel, fuel substantially. China, India, Japan, Russia, and others still rely on these kinds of fuel. Only a handful of nations So only a handful of nations like Greece, Spain, and Portugal have crossed the clean energy line. And the G7 meeting on meeting of ministers responsible for the environment, uh, climate, and energy held in Turin this last April, it was agreed that coal plants would be phased out among these nations by 2035, but that the participants were realistic enough to provide that those which could not meet the, the target should be allowed to continue to use coal fired plants on condition that it would not compromise their commitment on bringing down global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2030. So what some countries will do is to have the companies that are uh, emitting a lot of carbon to buy carbon uh, credits. For example, the, the, the big forest in the Amazon, they, 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 they keep the forest and they sell the carbon. It's actually traded uh, on the stock exchange in New York. I wish you would trade something like that here in Nigeria. But then we have a lot of forests. So it is unlikely that Japan can afford to stop using coal by 2035. Germany has set a 2030 de deadline, but there is no guarantee it will make it. The G7 member nations that campaign for the phasing out of coal plants by 2035 are those which have already abandoned coal plants or use them minimally. In other words, what the world saw at the recent G7 ministers meeting in Italy is self-interest everywhere and becoming the big elephant in the room as we go from this here in Nigeria and our government. The primary responsibility of, of every government is to its people, their welfare, and their security. This point is worth reiterating because Nigeria seems to pay more attention to gas exports than the domestic gas market exchange earnings, which the country needs desperately. Gas producers naturally prefer to export their products because their domestic prices are regulated, subsidized, and perhaps sold at below world market. In some cases, not in all cases. Besides, those who supply gas to privatized power generating companies are typically Oh, especially those Jenkos, not happening in our geometric power. I must tell you, we pay our bills. The trans Sahara gas pipeline is being constructed with a pipeline measuring 46 to 56 inch gauge so that it can carry billions of cubic meters of natural gas through North Africa. One of the two, one or two cynics have wondered in recent times how sustainable the project may be in the long run. This is because we Europeans, as you know very well from what I've been talking about, are in the forefront and the vanguard of eliminating fossil fuel. We want to ask ourselves, if they find alternative Will they buy our gas? By that time, 
who had invested, who had invested heavily on a huge pipeline. I think if you come close to any of the pipes, it's almost the height of yeah. an average human being. That's, that, that too, the way gas works is that you have to mine pack the gas before anybody even uses it, which means the thousands of kilometers on the line packed. You can imagine what, how much gas that is before you even begin to sell the gas. So, as Nigeria plans to embark on massive export of natural gas, the country is facing severe gas shortages at home. When General Tani Abacha military regime intervened in Sierra Leone in the 1990s under the ECOWAS rubric to flush out the military, the uh, new military regime, and restore democratic rule there, Nigeria was described by a section of the international community as a country that was exporting what we did not have. Democracy, but important, what is ought to have in abundance, namely the trading products. The description may well fit the gas sector today. Nigeria has more than 200 trillion cubic feet of untapped gas reserves. It is estimated that convertible gas is at least 139 trillion cubic feet. It is one of the world's leading countries in gas. Yet, there is not enough gas or even liquefied petroleum gas used in the kitchen. Even in Nigeria's liquefied natural gas company, there are now longer periods of electricity blackouts throughout the country. This is despite the spirited effort of Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, the Ministry of Power and the Presidency making a lot of efforts. Matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, I was very happy to hear that uh, the president inaugurated two major gas projects in the country. Uh, one at uh, Kuala and the other at Ohaji in the United States. These are very positive steps. We need to have more and more of these so that we can change our direction. I believe, really, and frankly, that a state of emergency needs to be de declared in the gas sector. The declaration we see in the power sector and allow the government and the other stakeholders to address fundamental issues in the gas sector in a robust manner. The issues will include how to strike healthy balance between producing gas for export and gas for domestic consumption. Gas is equally needed in both markets. Now, another critical area in Nigeria's power sector is the transmission network. I believe that having the national grid the way we have it is still going to be a problem. Of course, it is not robust, it's not well uh, structured. And my, my advocacy is for um, multiple grids, semi-autonomous, but connected to the national grid. So that the national grid still operates, and it's made more robust. It will begin to cure the, uh, the regular incidence of uh, failure of the network. When I was in government, we embarked on a project, or rather we embarked, we actually got, got Federal Executive Council to approve what we call a super grid, a 765 KV network that would kind of ride above the existing 330 KV network 
So you know, now, right now Nigeria has 330 KB and 132 KB, but none of them really robust. But the 765 KB network would be very important to, to keep uh, power from power plants such as the Mangila that has been in the works for a while. Over 10,000 megawatts of power will come from Mangila. So the question is, which uh, which transmission infrastructure will take that power? Suppose that we, we finish it. Now, you need a super grid to take that power and so that Nigeria has the ability to take power from various power plants and transmit to wherever we would want it. Now, I am happy that the current minister of power chief, Adebayo Adela, Adebo, Adela, is reviving this, uh, uh, this super grid. And I think we have to support him on that because it's a very important project. Our conception was that it would be um, done in sections by different companies so that it's not just uh, one of these big elephant, uh, uh, wide elephant projects that you give to one company and they just go and sit, sit uh, with it. The development of the electric power sector has also been stalled for years because of the suspension of what we, we developed at that time called Asha Risk Guarantee to support power purchase agreement. Um, a, a government that's buying power has to issue power purchase agreement to the uh, producer of power. And that power purchase agreement must be guaranteed. We can issue sovereign guarantee, but in the case that we are talking about, uh, we wanted to, uh, to have assurance guarantee supported by the World Bank and backstopped by Nigerian government. But only one project was completed on it. That is the Azura Edo project. 461 megawatt power plant, um, and then it was stopped nine years ago. So the outcome is that for that period of time, Nigeria had not commissioned a government sponsored power project. And you heard the president of Ghana, or president of Ghana, say that you need to be adding. He said 12 point, uh, over 12 percent of energy to your uh, country year on year. Because if you're going to grow the economy, that's what you need. So, I mean, the, it's very clear. So, if in nine years we have not added, you can imagine. I can also tell you that because of that pressure is guaranteed at least four or five major projects had been fully developed but stopped. So I encourage the government to reawaken those projects that are very important. The nations and commercial entities are guided principally by their interests. Despite their strong pledges to fight the climate change with all their might and resources, even environmentalists who fiercely insist that poor nations shut down their fossil fuel plants to save the earth. I call them tree huggers. Uh, they would have, they would come with patriotic stand, take patriotic stand when their country's interests are affected directly. For instance, Greenpeace Germany in August 2022 described Germany's decision to restore coal-fired plants as bitter, but inevitable. So even in the unlikely event that rich nations win themselves off fossil fuel within the foreseeable future, the earth will continue to be polluted because most developing nations do not have the resources and technical know-how to transition yet to cleaner energy. Bangladesh, a nation of 470 million people, has been building new coal power plants, and the beneficiaries are not just local people and local businesses, 
but also big Western firms like Walmart of the United States and Zara of Spain. Developed countries and multilateral institutions need to assist developing countries with technology, human capital development, infrastructure, and finance to grapple with the basic challenges of development. After all, the climate crisis was unleashed by the rich nations. The point of this is very, very important. The poor nations are merely the victims of mind to change the energy equation, just like the Greek and the Civil countries. It is up to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It's not an innovation, and it's not every day that you have the opportunity to listen to that wide-ranging intellectual offering based also on experience. Well, we have a frame of mind to address the energy question, and I'm sure that many of us who are being at the moment Chairman of uh, Otapia, Pan African Limited. Earlier on, when I introduced uh, Tingo Electric and Tingo Kula, well, this is part of the uh, Otapia Pan African Limited. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Israel Majesty, your name of FIFA, and I know I think that you are most experienced. Thank you. Baruch Monfife is uh, a father figure uh, to the settlement of today. They have a father and son relationship. Chief Alex Ibuyeni. Baruch Monfife. Oh, he's a Shiwaju? Oh, okay. Okay. Then there was a time uh, Chief Ibuyeni was a who? A who? A who? A who? A who? A who? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then we also have uh, the CEO of Future One Africa Network, um, Mr. Idris Usman. In our midst. Mr. Idris Usman, presidential candidate for the Labour Party, the president of the United Nations. My own let me your excellencies let me stand on all you existing protocols. My mind is a very simple one. First is to say big versions of the big day the level mood. And thank you for what you did here because until they said it, when we came in here, we were wondering what happened to this place. It's unfortunate that you have to be the one to change this place rather than enjoy it. So thank you very much for that contribution. It's well within the carpet and everything. That's why Nigeria work, lack of maintenance. So it's important that it's noted. And thank you for showing that we need to maintain a place because, as you said, you shouldn't have been the one doing it. We must learn to maintain before we build a new one. We should start building a new one until we finish the existing ones. <laughs> Number two, I thank the guest lecturer for what you did and what you said. Thank you. When the president of Ghana said they are generating and distributing 5,000 megawatts, I was wondering, Ghana with one seventh of our population probably generates and distributes more than, more than us. I was doing the calculation and we were discussing with Governor Duke. 
we must declare emergency in power. And the way to go is very simple. Embedded power and insist on gas supply. We have gas. We have it all over the place. I do not think, yes, we need the dollar. But I think making Nigeria more productive and pulling our people out of poverty, especially in the North, is far, will give us far more value and dollars than focusing on exports. I think it's time to declare emergency. Geometric has shown it in about that embedded power will help us in that emergency. We should encourage it all over Nigeria. Thank you. This is Dr. Radio Musa Pampaso, presidential candidate of the MNPP in the 2023 election. Former Senator of the Federal Republic, former Governor of Kansas. Our royal fathers, they are present. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking Almighty God for giving us this opportunity to be here. And also, it's an opportunity to congratulate our brother, our friend. Dele Mahmoud for attaining this age. I say on behalf of all of us, once again, congratulations to you. The chairman On the occasion, the former president of Ghana, I'm sure many people are not aware that Nigeria is the second home. And in Nigeria, Kano in particular. And because of his living in Kano, he speaks Hausa more than many of us. So it's a pleasure meeting you here once again, and I thank the celebrant for giving us this opportunity to meet our friends and brothers. Guest speaker, thank you for being enlightened. In fact, I, if there was time, I had wanted you to tell us more about your experience of the power generation and distribution in ABBA. And it will be a good opportunity, especially for businessmen and women, not only in Nigeria, but across the world, to achieve much more. Let me at this point say that, uh, especially the Governor Oshun is here, to say that uh, the importance of electricity cannot be overemphasized. And that was why, when I was governor uh, in Kano, I selected two out of 23 earth dams that we have in Kano. And they installed some equipment. And I'm happy to say that we were able to set up the power generation in Kano on Chalawa Gorge and Tiger Dams, producing or potentially to produce 35 megawatts. We completed the job in 2015, and I'm happy to say that I left 43 million US dollars in our account for the incoming governor to do the generate, I mean, the distribution. Uh, of course, uh, not much was being done, but I'm sure our uh, governor now, uh, Abba Kabir Yusuf, will complete. You are laughing as if you didn't, you knew 
that you couldn't find about the 43 million naira when we came back. So, Governor Ajeleke, she look at it. all the other governors for that matter. She look at the possibility of generating power because it's not a matter of only state. I mean, the federal government alone. We will have to put all our heads and hands together to ensure that there is adequate and, of course, enough electricity uh, in this uh, country. For purposes of time, I want to say to you, celebrant, once again, congratulations, and we wish you many more years of productive services to our nation. Thank you, and God bless you. Through there, thank you very much indeed. We're still trying to manage time. Uh, let me call Chief Kola Karim, Chairman of British American Tobacco, Costain, and others. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to stand on all existing protocol. First and foremost, I would like to say congratulations to our brother, Chief. For his birthday. The topic is a very important one when we think of Nigeria, think of Africa, and think of where this continent of Africa is going. If you think about politics, connect the nexus with energy, you talk about strength or lack of. Let me unpack this. Nigeria, 37 billion barrels of oil reserves. 206 TCF of gas reserves, then when we connect that to what the possibilities are, it's endless. We had the chairman of the occasion talk about energy and Nigeria lead in the pack. We had Professor Bat in Nigeria talk about the power of unveiling that strength in the character of what Nigeria could be. And let me connect this. If Nigeria puts the directed investment in building up our gas reserves and gas resources, Nigeria will be a standard power in the forefront of what President Mahama said as a leading light in Africa. Why? If you connect this, West African gas pipeline is already built. If we extend that as they're proposing to do, to go all the way, to Morocco connecting to Spain, the Trans-Saharan gas pipeline connecting through the Sahara, again, through African nations into Europe. If we go to the east, connecting through Central African Republic going down south, imagine unleashing 206 TCF. That is production of gas volumes for over 50 years. Imagine what that would do to 54 countries on this continent. Another strength we must think about, and this is what I'm going to leave all of us with, if we see Russia with the geopolitical situation in Europe, the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, Russia was selling $500 million of gas per day into Europe. Just think about that connectivity and the strength of what President Mahama said and what our discussing leader said, where Nigeria could be in the forefront of driving Africa's growth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Donald Duke, former governor of Costa Rica. Thank you, Your Excellencies, Your Majesties, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, the congratulations. Congratulations on your birthday. Let me share a story with us, and you can contextualize it as you may. In 1985, I was a young intern in a, in a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Baker and Hostetler. My immediate master, lady, late Mr. Betty Murphy, was Secretary of Labor under Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. And one afternoon, she invited me to our office 
And in a rebuking manner, asked me a question. What is wrong with Nigeria? I was barely 23 years old, so I didn't understand what she talked about, but I just felt that everything was wrong with Nigeria at the time. She said she had just come back, come out, come back from the White House and had a meeting with the chief of staff to President Reagan, and she were, they were very upset with Nigeria. They had proposed building a trans-African pipeline from Nigeria's Niger Delta through Niger into Algeria to Europe to forestall Soviet gas. It was the politics of gas, and we're talking about leadership here. Um, I thought it was a brilliant idea. We talked about the Niger Delta. At that time, I didn't even understand what the Niger Delta was all about. But it was going to be paid for totally by the Western world. We were not going to, all, we wanted, all they wanted from us was agreement and they would do it. And from there, we could tee up gas to distribute to the rest of, of the country. But we gave a condition. And the condition was the United States would have to pull out of South Africa. She said it was a very stupid thing for us to do, and I agree. That you first get what you want. You know, like in the aircraft, you wear your mask before you look after others. Um, and she said, no one gives the United States conditions. She reminded me that at the Bay of Pigs, where there are missiles, Soviet missiles, facing the United States, there were also NATO missiles in Turkey facing the Soviet Union at the time. But the condition the, the Russians gave was, of course, you take out your missiles from Turkey and we'll take out our missiles from, from uh, Cuba. The Americans agreed, but on condition that you do not tell the world that we obliged you that. It would have made more sense if we had agreed and would have had a lot more leverage if we had agreed to allow the pipeline go through. Today it's a difficult situation because you're going to go through Niger. Niger is fully aligned with the Soviet with Russia today. I do not think they would even allow that to happen. But this is a nation that at one point were flaring 2.5 billion cubic feet of gas daily. That's an equivalent of 25 million liters of diesel. You think of it. For over 40 years we were flaring, burning 25 million liters of diesel. Talking about in the abundance of water. Thank you. Please, sir. Well, let me now call on the only Richard, only Adimula. His Royal Majesty, Adia Yu Gus, only of his friend, Ojaja Mister. Your Excellencies, the celebrant of today, our dear brother, I think I see you more as Nigerian than even Ghanaian. The elders that are here, the political leaders of our their country. At least I've seen two here. The Kakwansia movement and uh, our amiable tsunami <laughs> from Labour Party. Please give all of them a resounding round of applause. I even noticed something about the Kakwansia movement. Their logo, the red and white. I, look, I saw that it's actually indeed red and white. <laughs> but I look around, maybe it's distinguished senator to come for Africa, part of 
of APC. That is here. But I'm very happy that this hall is indeed all party affair for our and their country. Our nation is way bigger than any one of us, way bigger than any political party or anything that has to do with party affiliation. The day we all sit down to talk about our interest commonly as a nation, other than our selfish interests as individuals, things will be better for our entire country. <laughs> We're stronger individually than us doing things are very collective. And that has been the problem of our their nation. People came, spoke very briefly, aptly, straight to the point. They are leaders, both in the private sector and public sector. A lot of Nigerians can actually talk and talk about the solution of this problem. But what are we all doing? very important for us to know. We've been talking about gas abundance for a very long time. We've been talking about so many things in this country that are in abundance that we can actually even extract and that we will not focus on dollar economy. But the truth be told, the day as a nation that we start doing things, not individually, the day we realize that this country is bigger than all of us, a good example of the celebration today, that we are bringing all political parties together, irrespective of your party affiliation, that we will realize that Nigeria is bigger than all of us, then we will be a better nation. For us to settle all these problems of energy, is no rocket science. And that's the truth. It's because of our selfish interest. That's the reason why we've been having a lot of bottlenecks here and there. Selfish interest. So I want to appeal to each and every one of us. Talk is cheap. Enough of talking and talking and talking as a nation. Let us look at this nation beyond all of us bigger than all of us, and let us jointly and collectively look at things that will be betterment, that will be in good structure and in a very futuristic manner that can better the lot of even generation yet unborn. On this day, I want to thank God Almighty for the celebrant's life. What you are doing, you have actually displayed Selflessness that is very rare in our country by upgrading this all. Let each and every one of us pick our public utilities, whatever we can do. Government cannot do it all. Let us imbibe this culture. What the celebrant has actually done today, I want each and every one of us to give him a resounding round of applause. He bought new ACs and a new carpet and gave this place a very good uplift. So, as a nation, what are you doing? God bless you all and God bless Nigeria. Thank you very much. Your Royal Majesty, Your Excellencies, 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I think um, Dr. Ruben Abati must have had some kind of sixth sense that I was about to leave. <laughs> so he caught me, but um, it was for a good reason. And the good reason is our celebrant, Chief Dili Momodi. Well, it's a goodwill message, and I actually have nothing more than goodwill for him. I have admired him for a long time. He has been, uh, has been a good brother, a good friend, a good professional. The other day I sent him a message. I said, I wonder what your passport looks like. <laughs> it just occurred to me, you know, when you think about all the places that he has been to, and I, I think of all the stamps, and I wonder whether we have more stamps than passports. But anyway, I want to congratulate him for the wonderful work that he has done over the years. I think he is one of the most consistent journalists that I can say we have in this country. He's also very professional and he is a creative journalist. He sees opportunities to report and inform, to educate and entertain in virtually every situation in which he finds himself. I wonder sometimes whether he sleeps. And even when he's asleep, <laughs> what kind of dreams does he have? Is it possible that the, the dreams are more than the reality? I'm not sure. But we need to congratulate him. We need to celebrate with him. We need to wish him God's continued guidance and protection and blessings. And um, I want to say publicly that I will probably never forget something that happened some years ago when both of us happened to find ourselves shooting a commercial for a particular product in South Africa. We were in Cape Town, and we got to the place, we got to the hotel, and we were sorting out, uh, checking in and that sort of thing. And Chief Momodu said, Auntie, don't imagine you're going to pay for your hotel accommodation. Please, that's on me. So let me take this opportunity to say publicly, thank you very much. God bless you. And may your pockets be continually replenished in the name of Jesus. Happy birthday. See you again next year. Okay, we're trying to uh, keep faith with you. And uh, this uh, high chief of the media in Nigeria. Fully got and speak totally God knows how many languages. Mr. BC Allah Tiba, founder of this country. May I please ask us to put our hands together for this gentleman here? Do you every day? Well done, <laughs> Ruben Amati. Now, the man was celebrating today. I am only 70 years. The man is 64. And when he sees me, he goes down to greet me the way we do, to show respect to me. May God bless you, Dele. What do we say about Dele that hasn't been said here? And will have to be said continuously. My prayer for you, please, just keep on the thing you'll be doing that is increasing my day. Now, Professor Park Naji, congratulations for the revolution you have ignited that has brought power to the whole of Albania. I'm hoping that you will ignite it 
So parts of Nigeria. Can't get any money, but you don't need it. But I'll give it to you. You don't get the money. I need it. I'm very gonna go. I'll give it to you. You go call me. I can do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course you know that I present a program called POS. It's just one hour a week on people's platforms. But like you heard my younger brother say a while ago, I run a 24-hour platform in the last seven years. And you guys, you know that power is hardly there in Nigeria. So if I've been operating in another environment that has far a good supply, we don't have been a big man today, and I know I'm speaking the minds of so many of us here. So, Dele, it's a birthday present to give to all of us. I have been in school here, I've learned so much, and I will pray along with it, so that what this man is doing in Abba can be translated to all parts of Nigeria. May God bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Now, to bring uh, the occasion to a close, we have the chairman's closing remarks, and after that, Beckham Amonu will give the vote of thanks. Chairman's closing remarks, President Mahama. Distinguished guests, and your immediate excellence and distinguished. From myself, on behalf of my dad, and the rest of our family, I would like to humbly thank you all for joining us today on this great day of celebration. My dad is a man who continues to show a great love for Nigeria and for Africa. By joining us here today, whether you come from there or from far, we have shown that his struggles have not been in vain and his efforts have not gone unnoticed. So we are very grateful to have had you here today and once again, thank you very much indeed. I would also like to extend our thanks to the organizers, the staff behind the scenes, the ushers running up and down, making sure that everyone is comfortable, the media who have continued tirelessly to capture uh, this wonderful moment and so thank you all and just to wrap up once again that happy birthday and good to see you again. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 